Good morning, and welcome to video worship for Stewartstown Presbyterian Church. Here we are again online. This uh, year has been full of ups and downs and twists and turns, and just when we thought we would be able to get back together in person for a few more weeks of worship at Christmas time, uh, the governor changed his, uh, his guidelines, and uh, we as a, a church uh, are following his guidelines. And so we will suspend in-person worship at least through uh, January 4th, um, and we'll evaluate uh, with whatever recommendations he makes after that. Uh, this year, the old uh, Christmas song, I'll Be Home for Christmas, has a uh, much different meaning uh, because so many of us are going to be home uh, alone for Christmas or home in isolation or quarantine or home in our small bubble group. Uh, so we, uh, we extend a warm welcome from the church family to all of you who are watching. Uh, wherever you are, however you're uh, catching this service, we extend a warm welcome to you. Uh, we're going to send out a mailing this week uh, with some uh, little uh, uh, Christmas note and a, a gift from the church. Uh, part of our Christmas Eve tradition has always been to, uh, to light a candle and to, to pass the light of Christ around to each one of us. Uh, this year, uh, we may be able to do uh, an outdoor service or something uh, creative outside, but for the most part, uh, we're going to be worshiping on Christmas Eve in our homes and so we're uh, sending out a Christmas Eve candle to you, and we're inviting you to send us back a picture of you and your candle. We'd love to include those pictures in our video worship for Christmas Eve. Uh, so whether you want to take a picture of yourself holding a candle or a picture of a, a candle sitting on the table in front of you, uh, whether a picture of you in your favorite Christmas sweater or uh, just you around the house, uh, we'd love for you to send a picture back to the church. Uh, you can email it to the church at stpresby at verizon.com, or you can send it uh, to myself. Uh, but we'd love for you to get a picture back to us so that we can include that in our Christmas Eve service online as we virtually pass the light of Christ around to each of us. So uh, look forward to uh, getting a little package from the church at the end of next week. Uh, with a note from our deacons and some Christmas encouragement as we uh, kind of share the light of Christ virtually this year. Also, as we share the light of Christ, we are thankful for uh, your offering and the way that we as a church have been able to uh, share his blessings with our community. Uh, because of your faithful contributions, uh, we've been able to go above and beyond our church budget and share our benevolences with um, other groups in our community. Uh, the Mason Dixon Family Services, uh, as well as extra gifts to um, 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 the Life Pathways in York and the uh, uh, Southern Family Services, uh, or Southern Community Services, and the uh, Columbia Presbyterian Church. So uh, because of your gifts, we're able to give above and beyond our church budget to those groups, so thank you. Uh, if you uh, would like to make a, an extra special gift, gift uh, to another cause. Uh, this year, uh, as in all years, we take up an offering for Christmas Joy. Our Christmas Joy offering goes towards retired church workers, uh, missionaries, and pastors uh, who have special needs in their retirement, as well as uh, uh, Presbyterian colleges and uh, colleges serving minorities. So if you would like to uh, support our Christmas Joy offering, we invite you to mark your um, envelope or mark your offering Christmas Joy uh, clearly so that we can set that aside. And in addition to our budgeted amount, we'll uh, send an extra gift to the Christmas Joy offering this year. Well, as we uh, prepare for our worship today, I would uh, like to uh, share a poem from the, uh, the book Kneeling in Bethlehem from Ann Weems. Uh, this uh, poem seems particularly appropriate for this strange season of artificial worship. Our crush set came complete with stable and a plastic angel. Small, not at all to scale. The white-garbed creature was, with uncertain wings was obviously an afterthought. Thrown in to complete the set, otherwise ceramic and hand-painted, Unless, of course, this angel was a last-minute substitute for one which was irresistible to the packer. In that case, somewhere I have an irresistible ceramic angel, dressed in glorious 
read, kneeling or flying on someone else's coffee table even now as I unwrap the plastic angel. If I could ever bring myself to throw away an angel, it would be this one. This one with no redeeming features. And yet each year as I unwrap the plastic angel, I hesitate again to pitch this celestial messenger. I'm reminded of my own lack of glory, my own plastic attempts at celebrating Christmas, my own feeble annunciations, and once again I place this bit of plastic over the stable. If the plastic angel can get this far, perhaps there's a place in Bethlehem town for me. Let us prepare for worship through the music of the prelude. Join me in the call to worship as it appears on your screen. Light shines on the righteous and joy on the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you who are righteous, and praise his holy name. 
Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence, Lord. They rejoice in your name all day long. They celebrate your righteousness. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. And if you spend yourself in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like noonday. Let us pray. Come, O holy God, and shine upon us like the star of Bethlehem, that the darkness of our days and the worries of our hearts might be overshadowed by your glorious presence. Come, O mighty one, and vanquish the powers of oppression and hatred. Set your spirit of love and justice upon us, that we might be your holy people, and that we might give hope to your world. Come, O humble one, who was not too proud to come into our world and be laid in a manger. Humble our hearts, that we might bow our wills in complete obedience to you, and offer our lives as gifts in service to you, our King. Come, Lord Jesus, and dwell with us this season as God Emmanuel, God with us. This is the third Sunday of Advent. On this Sunday, we remember that Jesus came to bring us joy. The angels appeared before the shepherds, saying, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. For to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Let us pray. Dear God, there was a lot that is strange this year. There was a lot that we could worry about, but remind us of the reason for this season. Fill our heart with joy as we celebrate the Savior of the world. Amen.
scripture reading today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Listen for the word of the Lord. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. backstory. I love a good story. I love a good story especially when it is one of those epic stories. Those epic stories that ends with good winning out over bad, with some great epic battle at the end. I enjoy the tension when it looks like the good folks aren't going to win. When it looks like the hero has been defeated or the heroine has been crushed. I love that unexpected way that the pieces come together just at that crucial moment. When the plan within the plan is revealed and the pieces line up and the evil warlord is defeated by his hubris or the heroine has more strength than anyone imagined. And there have been some great epic stories in our modern days. Stories like Star Wars, The Lord of the Rings, the Harry Potter series. For the younger crowd, they've probably been mesmerized by all the action in the Marvel or DC Universe characters. The stories end with tears of joy and some tears of sorrow, but it ends in triumph, where evil is defeated and the good win out. And no matter where you start telling this kind of epic story, there's always more to the story. There's always some little piece that's scattered along the story that looking back fits so perfectly in the story. 
some little interaction that you don't understand until later when you know the whole story. Like Luke Skywalker and Leah are siblings, or that Snape loved Harry Potter's mom since they were children. We all get that little boost of energy when those pieces come together and there's that, aha, now I get it, now I know why they did that, now I understand. That's part of a great epic tale. There's always more to the story. That's true in a great epic book, and it's true in life. And it's true in the story of Jesus. Each gospel writer, each preacher, each person who has ever tried to explain Jesus to a friend, each person has had to decide how to start the story. Because there's always so many ways. Always so much more that could be said. Always so much more we could add. If you were to start the story of Jesus, if you were going to explain Jesus to someone at Christmas, would you start like Luke with the babe and the manger? Or maybe you would skip ahead. Start at the end with the cross and work your way back to the beginning. Maybe you would be like Mark, the gospel writer. Mark starts his story, as we heard a few weeks ago, with a wild man calling from the outskirts of world. John the Bee called out from the wilderness like a wild man, telling people to get ready. A stranger then is baptized and then goes walking off into the wilderness. If we were filming Mark's gospel, we would probably zoom in on the back of this stranger as they walk off into the barren hillside, alone, unprepared. Mark starts his story that way. And if we started the story that way, there'd be plenty of questions. Who is this strange man? Why does he go off into the wilderness like this to fight his inner demons or battle? It's like some some action hero who goes off into some unconventional training camp in the wilderness to, to get strong and to build up muscle and be prepared to come back and conquer the enemy. But who is this stranger? What's his story? Who are his people? Where did he come from? All of those questions Mark skips over in his gospel. But those are the kinds of questions that Matthew and Luke answer for us. This morning we focus on Matthew's story about the birth of Jesus to see if we can understand the steps that God took, the things that God put in place to get ready for the birth of Christ. And to see also if we are prepared to take steps to get ready for Christmas this year. Well, when we think of the Christmas story, we often think of Luke's version. The angels, the star. We think of a Christmas pageant image of all of these things, magi and donkey and manger and innkeeper all sort of gathered around while the star glows in the heavens and angels sing out alleluias, we often see the scene as a a kind of divine, otherworldly event, something with stars and angels and gifts and gold. But Matthew doesn't start his story with any of that. The opening scene in Matthew is really kind of boring. It's a long list of fathers and sons So-and-so begot so-and-so begot so-and-so. I mean, very boring. If we were to picture the beginning of Matthew's gospel in a more cinematic way, we might picture a, a laborer putting down his toolbox and laying a, a masonry block, stone, in a foundation line. And one block sat next to another block, carefully and slowly lining them up, moving down. 
And we would be tempted to kind of jump ahead, to kind of see the finished product or to skip over that boring stuff. But Matthew lays this out for us, one stone after another, step by step, by painfully slow step. And if we were a good director of our movie, we would bring our character back day after day to see him do exactly the same thing. One block put down next to another block, next to another block. Every now and then there might be a few special features, an interesting cutout in the wall, but day after day, year after year, our character comes back. Only at the end do we realize that he's been He's been building this wonderfully beautiful palace or cathedral. Only later would we understand the full work of the Mason. So it is with Matthew's story. Matthew starts off an account of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then he lays down stone after stone. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Each stone, a substantial weight, each stone carefully laid down and packed in and sealed in its place, each stone carefully aligned so that the path goes the right way. Stone after stone, the foundation is laid carefully and slowly. One generation after another, after another, slow going, like making a palace or a cathedral. And of course, there would be setbacks in the construction. A wall that had to be reset, supplies that didn't show up. And we know from reading the Old Testament in this beautiful genealogy that there were a number of difficult labors. There were stories in the Old Testament of couples unable to conceive and bloodlines that seemed to be going the wrong direction. There were wars and failures. The Babylonian captivity was not just about the end of people living in Jerusalem, it was about the end of the city of David and perhaps the end of David's line. And brick after brick, life after life, struggle after struggle, Matthew lays out this story for us. Struggle and success, struggle and success. There were a few unexpected jewels in this rather gray stonework. Several women make the list and they stand out in an unusually bleak uniform pattern. Women like Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, the wife of Uriah, and Mary. And then just as that last piece is ready to be put down on the palace, after all those years and all those generations, just as the last piece is ready to go in place, the mason gets to a problem. The capstone doesn't fit. In genealogical terms, we can see all of these generations being placed from Abraham to David, from David to the captivity, from the captivity to Joseph. We read, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. And there's the misstep. After all of these generations, we get to the end of the line and the last piece doesn't fit. The last piece is a clearly mismatched piece. Joseph had all the pedigree. Son of David, son of Abraham. He is ready to fulfill his role as the father of the Messiah, but he is not. He is the husband of Mary the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. And Mary is ready to take her place next to these other women, some of whom were the other woman, 
all of whom had some blemish on the reputation, all of whom might have been considered disreputable by the self-righteous, but all of whom Scripture reveals as faithful and obedient. And Mary, too, falls in line with that pattern. She could have been judged unfaithful, disreputable, but she is revealed as the most faithful. All of that is in this backstory. And we almost skip over it. We almost jump to the conclusion. We want to get to the palace. We want to get to the capstone. We want to see the angels and Messiah born to save the world. But we miss all of this backstory. And I would say the whole story hinges on Joseph. Except the whole story hinges on each of these steps. Each person, each generation, each couple, each birth, so fragile, so, so likely to fail. And yet each one builds the wall carefully, painstakingly. Matthew, the writer, has given us a clue here that his story about the birth of Jesus ties into the story of genealogy because he's used the same word for genealogy as he does for the beginning of the Messiah, the birth. Like a word play on beginning and begetting. The stories are tied together. And we often think of the Christmas story with great fanfare. The miracle of birth, especially this birth. And we think of angels and shepherds and alleluias and magi and star. And that's all such an impressive scene for us. But Matthew, here at this point in the story, lays out the scene with a thousand brushstrokes. The small steps of countless people. And make no mistake, these are not inconsequential steps. These steps are so very consequential but they are small steps, people-sized steps. No doubt Joseph had been struggling with what to do about Mary. No doubt he had had some sleepless nights, some uncertain conversations with friends and family. And he wakes up from this dream, no doubt somewhat confused. He hadn't slept well at all, and now he struggles to hold on to that vision. What was, what was that he saw? What was it that they said to him? He struggles to hold on to that, that smoke that disappears in the morning, and yet he is expected to risk his reputation, perhaps to risk his family's life on this morning mist. And we can imagine that Joseph was strong and confident that he, he clicked with the vision just like that and woke up ready to do what he needed to do. But he, if he was as mortal as you and I, perhaps it was some, with some uncertainty that he followed the angel's instructions. Perhaps his friends and fami family had more than a few arguments with him about just leave Mary alone, just let her be, just walk away from her. But he does not. And our scene here ends with great drama. But we miss the drama. Because these are not our people, not our customs. And the text says, and he gave him the name Jesus. And we know with that end to chapter 1 that Joseph has taken a most courageous step of faith. To name a child was to claim a child. To name a child was to claim the child as surely as if you were the birth father. No doubts, no hesitations, he names this child and like that, in one phrase, the capstone is laid on the palace and the beautiful glorious structure is complete. And Joseph's unexpected courage has completed the story. He has made the lineage from Abraham to David through the struggles of captivity and exile, through the uncertainty of his decision. He has completed the line, and the Messiah is son of David, son of Abraham, son of Joseph. 
think we often picture the Christmas story as a big event, a great event, filled with beautiful music and choirs and cantatas. We often picture Christmas with holiday parties and family gatherings and the best gifts we can afford. And we think of Christmas as God's story, a bold and miraculous event filled with signs and deeply faithful people. But perhaps Matthew's backstory gives us a different picture, not of a big event, but of a thousand little steps. Not just of one or two bold people, but a thousand very human people. Matthew's backstory is about a humble struggle to be faithful when the world is not clear and all is not so bright. The backstory of Joseph is about a humble and quiet, obedient man. And perhaps it fits best for Christmas this year. This Christmas will not be bold and bright. Like the manger of Bethlehem on that first night, it might be a little cold and dark and lonely for us. And yet we are each invited to share in the story. Each invited to play our part in the kingdom of God. And like Joseph, we have to make a decision to do God things this year in a difficult and hard world. We choose as followers of Jesus to love one another, to share the peace of Christ, to offer the joy of good news in a world that is too filled with bleak news. Our call to worship today came from a passage at the end of Isaiah 58. The end of our call to worship is a verse from Isaiah 58, all about how we share the light of God when we set the oppressed free, when we feed the hungry, when we clothe the naked and provide shelter for the homeless stranger. And that chapter ends with this, then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Like an epic story, it ends in triumph, but it begins with slow and careful obedient steps. And this year we are each invited to quiet, obedient humility, to faithfully follow to love one another in simple ways, to help the least and the lost among us so that the light, the light of Christ might shine on all of us. The backstory reveals an epic, glorious, fulfilling, wonderful story of God completing his journey with careful steps, but obedient steps of ordinary people like me and like you. Amen. Let us join together and affirm our faith through the statement of faith from the book of Philippians, chapter 2, as it's printed in our bulletins. Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess to the glory of God. Jesus is Lord. Amen. There are a number of prayer concerns listed on our bulletin that was sent around by email. We invite you to email any prayer concerns that you have to our church office where we'll include them in our prayer chain. Let us pray. While the world rested in a quiet night, you, O Lord God, spoke and your voice, which called forth heaven and earth, called into being a child, your word in flesh. 
In the darkness of the world, you looked upon your people, and light shone in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. O Lord Jesus, you are the Prince of Peace, the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. We offer our praise to you as we celebrate your appearance in the world and your life in our lives. Holy Spirit, fall upon the world gently this season, that all the world might find joy at this time of struggle. Fall upon us gently, O Spirit of the living God, that we might find life, life abundant, even in the struggles of life and death going on around us, even in the worries of our lives and the burdens of our hearts. May you, O Spirit, shine forth your light, bring your peace, and grant us hope. We pray, Lord, for our world. We pray for doctors and nurses, the medical staff, and all of those who struggle to bring about health and healing. We pray now even more, Lord, for those who are working on producing the vaccine and distributing it. We pray for ordinary people, like drugstore owners and truck drivers, and those who will be paper pushers to track and orchestrate this logistics event. We pray in thankfulness for the work of so many hands that are bringing about changes in our lives. But also, Lord, we pray in humility, knowing that there are still more lives that will be lost, still other people who will struggle under this sickness. We ask, O oh Lord, that we might all use good judgment, that we might all seek to sacrifice some of our freedoms to keep people whole and healthy. And Lord, especially in the season of Christmas, may we be careful with our encounters, that we might share joy and love and peace and hope through our words and our conversations, but maybe not so much in person. Lord, bless us as your church as we find ways to worship and adore you in new ways this season. Lord, we ask your blessing upon us as we connect to our neighbors, as we care and comfort those who sit alone in quiet nights, that we might find ways to bring your light and love to others. For we ask this in the name of Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now to the one who is able to do far more than we might ask or imagine. To God be the glory, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest and abide upon each of us, now and evermore. Amen. My friends, the peace of Christ be with you. Amen.